I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. Recently, California announced it would ban the sale of new cars that are gas powered in 2035. Oregon and Washington said, yeah, we'll go with you on that one. And it's not just talk. This morning, Oregon's agency that regulates such things had its final rulemaking hearing. And next month, they're going to get public testimony before enacting the exact same rules as California. And you won't have to wait 13 years to see the change in the process is going to begin in Oregon in four years, maybe even sooner, which definitely makes that our big story. Here's a fun fact that you can entertain your family with knowing California is the only state in America that can create its own auto emission rules. Did you know that it's true? We'll explain a little bit of the history of how that happened in just a little bit, but Every other state, including Oregon and Washington, has a choice to make. You could follow the more lax federal rules or adopt the tougher California ones. And if you decide to follow California, you have to follow it exactly. And that's why Oregon and Washington are on the road. See what I did there? On the road to banning the sale of new cars running on gasoline by 2035. Washington passed a law in 2019 committing the state to following California's emission rules. Many drivers are already behind the wheel of an electric car in Washington. The state recently hit the milestone of 100,000 EVs on the road. Now, building enough charging stations to support a lot more electric vehicles, that is going to be an engineering challenge. But the Washington Department of Ecology is confident it's all going to work out. The whole network we have to deliver fuels that gets it to our cars is a completely different system. But once we get that system built, you know, the real advantage of electric cars, aside from the fact that they emit far less pollution, is that uh, they're actually cheaper to operate. Washington State is already taking public comment on its rules for zero emission vehicles. That's ZEV, if you want to say it the way the cool kids do. So go to the Washington Department of Ecology homepage and type in ZEV, Z-E-V, and then scroll down to the bottom of the page of the first entry and you'll find a comment form if you want to give public comments there. As for Oregon, the State Department of Energy reports Oregon has 52,000 electric vehicles. Most are found in Multnomah, Washington and Clackamas County. But if you look closely there at the map, uh, you can see that Malheur County has 37 electric vehicles. Oregon adopted the California emission standards back in 2006 and we're still following their program. So look at this chart. It shows how the ZEV program is going to be rolled out here. Look at the numbers on the right. They show that in the year 2026, Less than four years from now, zero emission cars must make up at least 35% of all the new cars sent to Oregon for sale by auto companies. And while I say cars, I mean trucks as well, all vehicles. In less than four years, you're going to see a lot more ZEVs on the auto dealerships. But at least that's the plan. Now, some dealers I've talked to recently say it's really hard to get new electrical vehicles in right now. But things should get better. As you look down the chart, you can see the requirement is 100% of those new cars and vehicles by 2035. 100% going to be ZEVs. Now, some of you have asked if you'll have to scrap your gas power car or at least not sell it to somebody. The answer is no, you don't have to scrap it. You can keep the gas vehicle as long as you want, and at least for now, selling it is not a problem either. The Oregon agency coming up with these rules is the Department of Environmental Quality. Today they held a Zoom meeting complete with PowerPoint slides and super small boxes that are on the right for the speakers. And uh, it is something that uh, they talked about here. Um, so one of the things that they talked about was how much it's going to cost and that it's going to help. Uh, that it's going to. Reducing these emissions um, overall will provide a benefit to low-income communities and communities of color who are often disproportionately impacted by transportation pollution due to their proximity to roadways. It can also result in reduced mortality, reduced hospital visits, and fewer lost work days, resulting in financial savings at what we estimate is a total benefit of up to $625 million. OK, well, that's a lot of money. But when pressed, um, then the uh, speaker there was admitting that, well, that came from a California report. Now, they also talked about what it's going to cost the automakers to come up with all these changes and the modified versions and the ZEV and all that sort of thing. They estimated it's going to be about $3 billion. 
I got to tell you, though, an executive from Ford Motor Company who leads their electrification policy and projects team was on the call and could not let that one pass. Rachel, this is Steve from Ford. Um, I think um, Ford alone has committed to um, we're in the process of investing $50 billion before 2026 um, on our EV plan. And I, I know we're that's just Ford. The other companies are in similar spots. So there's a tremendous amount of investment being um, targeted for this, and that's a good thing. That's going to make this happen, but it's uh, a lot more than, than $3 billion. <laughs> so tons of money pouring in. In the end, the Oregon DEQ moved forward and will issue what's called its proposed rules next week. There will be public hearings on the rules in mid-October, then they're gonna take effect in December. Now, back to California's unique role in setting emission rules. Why, you ask, can't states set their own rules? Have you heard of states' rights? Well, it's because it's forbidden under the federal law. California is the only state in the country that can set its own limits on car emissions. The other states have to either follow federal rules, which are not as tough, or follow California's lead. And I think California's special treatment, well, that's definitely worth asking, how did we get here? For the answer to that question, we have to get in the Wayback Machine and go back to the 1940s. The first recognized occurrence of smog was in Los Angeles in 1943. Look at that. People's eyes and lungs burned and it was initially called a gas attack, blamed on a nearby plant that created a chemical used in synthetic rubber. But even after the plant shut down, the smog persisted. In 1947, the Los Angeles County Air Pollution Control District was formed, regulating power plants and oil refineries, and yet again, the smog was still there. It wasn't until the early 1950s that a Dutch bioorganic chemistry professor from Caltech, Dr. Ari Hagen Smit, discovered the culprit for smog was automobile exhaust produced by internal combustion engines. So, the state of California began taking action. It created air quality standards. In 1966, California established the first tailpipe emission standards in the country. And that leads us to a California governor you may have heard of, Ronald Reagan. In 1967, he approved the Mulford Correll Air Resources Act to create the State Air Resources Board meant to address air pollution in the Golden State. In that same year, Congress enacted the Federal Air Quality Act and it was within that piece of legislation that California was first given the ability to set its own air quality rules. And then in 1970, the Federal Clean Air Act expanded on the Air Quality Act and this time officially gave California the authority to set its own separate more stringent vehicle emission regulations to address what was called at the time the extraordinary circumstances of population, climate, and topography that generated the worst air in the nation. To this day, California is the only state that can apply for a Clean Air Act waiver to set stricter limits than the federal government. Other states like Oregon and Washington can choose to just follow the feds or to get behind California. If the states choose to follow California, they have to adopt identical regulations. No switching it up, no cherry picking what you like. And again, that's all because of the Federal Clean Air Act of 1970. So it's fair to say California wields tremendous environmental and economic power as they're the only ones who can say, hey, you don't like what the feds are doing when it comes to vehicle emissions? You wanna take it a step further? You have to follow our rules. And you can imagine that issue has ruffled some feathers along the way. One of those Clean Air Act waivers was rescinded by President George W. Bush and then restored by President Obama in 2013. But then President Trump rescinded it again in 2019. And then back in March of this year, the Biden administration restored it again, allowing the state to once again set its own emission standards. And a quick side note here, by the way, <clears throat> you ever been infuriated by that check engine light in your car? Well, you can blame the California Air Resources Board. They claim ownership of setting the standard for onboard diagnostic systems like that, beginning with 1988 model year cars. So yeah, that is how we got here. Now, I wanna hear from you. What do you think about all this? Are you a fan of electric cars or maybe even one of those fancy hydrogen cars one of these days? Are you hopeful the emission rules will help fight global warming? Send me an email, will you? Our address is the story at kgw.com or leave a voicemail, 503-226-5090. Now we want to update you on a story that ties two prevailing Portland themes together in a kind of a troubling way, the homeless crisis and the mental health care system. 
Our reporter Evan Watson showed us over the last couple of weeks how hard it is to force someone to get mental health treatment when they don't know that they need it. Well, here's a glaring example of the result. Last week, a woman broke into a Northeast Portland home and curled up on a child's bed before assaulting the homeowner. The entire thing caught on camera. Now, the Multnomah County District Attorney says <clears throat> his office will be taking another look at the case after initially declining to charge the intruder. The woman who broke into the house was identified as Terry Zinzer, and she's no stranger to law enforcement. In fact, since late July, she's had several run-ins with police and dozens since the mid-90s. A statement from the DA's office indicates Zinzer suffers from mental health issues and has repeatedly refused treatment, with the DA now saying they're going to take another look at the case. It's basically them saying, look, enough is enough. Perhaps Zinzer needs to be detained in order to keep the community safe. Let's walk through more of the video. You see Terry Zinzer walk into the Kelsey Smith's Northeast Portland home. Zinzer goes right into a child's bedroom, curls up on the bed until Smith realizes that she's there. Smith yells at Zinzer, who eventually gets up, throws an ottoman at Smith, and then walks out. Police found Zinzer and arrested her. Initially, the DA declined to charge her because she had similar cases dismissed, and that was due to a lack of participation and treatment in the court's ability to force Zinzer to get treatment. And it can be very challenging in hospitals with doctors. It can be even more challenging for family members, um, the community to understand, oh my gosh, it's so obvious that this person is experiencing some, some mental health symptoms. And why aren't you getting this person treatment? Well, unless it can be proven in court that the person is imminently dangerous because of their mental illness, then the law says you can't force them to do that. And it's, it's hard. That's Kathy Shumate, the Behavioral Health Supervisor in Multnomah County. Evan Watson talked with her and others for his recent investigative series called Uncommitted. It explored the civil commitment process or forced treatment and the high bar of state standards for forced mental health treatment. You can see the slippery slope in cases like this one where clearly there's a problem. But because the bar is set so high to force someone to get treatment, the DA was initially going to let this one slide. We'll certainly let you know if they decide to move forward with charges against Zinser as soon as we find out. And it's important to note the gaps in the mental health system are not restricted to big cities. There are issues in small communities as well. And that's the topic of Evan's next installment of Uncommitted. It's going to air on Thursday right here on The Story. Evan recently traveled to Morrill County in eastern Oregon, where he talked with the district attorney about the problems there and with the mental health system statewide. You have to tell them the standard is, I'm sorry, but I know your, your family member is talking about killing themselves, but they need to be closer to it. How can you tell a family member that? You know, how can you tell them, you know, they're saying, no, I think my brothers is gonna kill themselves. They've talked about it. We have to stop them now. And you have to say, well, in detail, what steps have they taken? Oh, they want to overdose. Do they have the pills? Oh, we have to know if they have the pills. Do they have the knife? Oh, I don't know if they do or not, you know. Well, unless they have that or in the process, that's not a harm to self for civil commitment in Oregon. Again, look for that segment this Thursday here on The Story. And if you missed any of Evan's uncommitted segments a few weeks ago, you can watch them all right now. Well, maybe after this show. They're on KGW Plus, our Roku and Fire TV app. You can also find them on the KGW YouTube channel. Two years ago, Oregon voters passed Measure 110, decriminalizing small amounts of drugs, promising that drug users will have treatment options. That largely has not happened yet. But now the Oregon Health Authority says a bunch of money is headed out to help. Where it's going when the story returns.
It's been two years since voters passed Measure 110, and it's something I know a lot of you have a lot of questions about. The measure decriminalized small amounts of drugs and promised instead to provide treatment centers for drug addiction using money from the state's marijuana tax revenue. The measure passed with 58% approval from Oregon voters. So what's happened since? Well, by many accounts, things on both the drug and mental health fronts got a lot worse. Drugs are coming into our area at rates that law enforcement officers say they've never seen before. Overdose deaths are skyrocketing. People who are either high or having mental health crisis or both are suffering both on the streets and in homes. If someone is searching for mental or medical treatment, they are not finding it. Some facilities are full. In many places, beds are not available. The healthcare workers are short staffed and that in places where facilities exist already. So what's happened to the promise of Measure 110? Many, many of you have written to us and told us that you think it's made the drug crisis worse instead of better, along with all the issues that can often happen around drugs like homelessness and violence. Many of you think it needs to be reversed and drug users should be thrown in jail. James wrote to us last week and said, Measure 110 has supported drug use and has led to more people using drugs. This is obvious. Just look around. The reality is that this law enables existing addicts and no doubt has created many new addicts. It's time to repeal this horrible law. Well, today the Oregon Health Authority announced that they've made a big step forward in implementing Measure 110. They say the first two years worth of money from the measure is now on its way to communities across the state. It won't go directly to adding treatment facilities or even beds. Instead, the money's gonna go to organizations working on wraparound services like outreach, mentorship, recovery housing and harm reduction methods like overdose reversal and needle exchanges. Here's an idea of where some of the money has already gone, according to the Oregon Health Justice Recovery Alliance. More people are alive in Marion and Lane County today because the HIV Alliance used Measure 110 funds to directly reverse over 500 overdoses. Bridges to Change, who was about to close their doors in Wasco County due to the pandemic, was able to save their recovery house there and expand their presence in the Dalles. And the Miracles Club was able to double their staff to support their outreach efforts to the African-American community. CORE and Eugene was able to increase their street outreach to high-risk youth from four times a month to four times each week. These things and more happen thanks to an initial $30 million investment <clears throat> and I think it's important to just imagine the impact this remaining $265 million investment will have. Soon, every community in all 36 counties across Oregon will have access to a full range of services to help meet people where they're at, address their trauma, and provide the vital supports needed to heal and recover closer to home and that person's first language and by someone who understands and shares their culture. Despite the slow rollout, OHA, OHA says they stand by the claim that it's better than letting police try to solve the drug crisis. We had 50 years of incarcerating people for your using substances, and if that had been effective, we wouldn't be in the position we are in today. We have more people incarcerated and more people addicted. So no, um, there's plenty of studies out there that show that forced treatment and uh, coerced treatment are not only uh, ineffective, um, but they can also be really harmful to folks. They have harmful outcomes. OHA admits they still have a long way to go. For one thing, they're still working on gathering statistics to find out how many people are actually seeking this kind of help after they're cited by police for drug use. They say right now there's not a uniform citation across the state. We know you have a lot of questions and thoughts about Measure 110. Send them our way. It's the story at KGW.com. Still ahead on the story, big changes could be on the way for every school district in Washington state. The proposal from the state superintendent for kindergartners through the eighth grade, right after the break.
to Washington State now and a story that parents and grandparents going to want to pay attention to. The Washington State Superintendent has proposed on the table for every school district in the Evergreen State. He wants bilingual education. <laughs> Boy, if I could talk. He wants bilingual education to be an option for all kindergarten through eighth graders by the year 2040. Here's why, according to the state superintendent. The evidence is clear. When young people become bilingual during the early grades, they have more cognitive flexibility and they perform better in school. As our global economy changes and our world becomes increasingly international, dual language education must become a core opportunity for our students. Right now, 35,000 students across 42 Washington State school districts learn in these dual language programs. Eric Wilkinson shows us how it works. Todo lo que los científicos hacen nos ayudan. It's a new school year and a new language for a lot of the kids at Madison Elementary. Los científicos investigan mucho. The school's been fully bilingual since 2019. Hey, why Parents esperar? choose to send their kids here for that reason. Everything is done in both English and Spanish. Me gustan los libros. Fifth grader Olivia Ruiz says it helps bring kids together. A lot of my friends speak Spanish, like more fluently than I do. And, um, so if I forget something or I don't know how to say something, they can help me out. But there is criticism of dual language programs. They're often inconsistent. Washington's would stop before high school, meaning some students could lose much of what they've learned. Subjects can also be difficult to learn. If a student struggles with, say, science, a foreign language can be another hindrance. And studies show it takes seven years for a second language to fully click with kids, so academics in the early years may suffer. But teacher Cecilia Guzman Marone says further research shows the benefits outweigh any drawbacks. As soon as they hit that like seven year mark where they start to get that academic and it starts to click, they start to surpass their peers that were in monolingual programs. Cecilia is a daughter of immigrants and didn't learn English until kindergarten. She started out despising school because she didn't understand what was going on. She says bilingual classrooms are about much more than just learning a language. They're also about teaching compassion. They will never have to feel like they can't communicate with their teacher because someone in this building at some point can, un can communicate with them in their language. It's a gift. Why not? Parents would have the option to enroll their child in a dual language program under this proposal, but it would kick off in more school districts as early as 2026. The statewide proposal is waiting on more funding from the state legislature. Around $19 million are needed to get things up and running for the first two years. Spanish wouldn't be the only alternative to English. Some programs would include Vietnamese, some Native American dialects as well. When we come back, how you can help foster kids in the Salem area.
This week for our Hey Help campaign, we're highlighting Salem Angels. They help empower children and families in the foster care system by providing community support for, with several programs like Love Box. Volunteers create personalized care packages each month to meet the needs of children and parents in the foster care system to help provide support and create community. This can include snacks, activities or books for kids, or gift cards or household supplies for parents. If you'd like to donate to Salem Angels or learn how to volunteer to create love boxes, open up the camera function on your phone right now and hover it over the QR code right there on your screen and you can donate to them directly. Hey, that's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching and remember the story, our story, well that never ends. I'll see